and welcome. This is the Ben Shapiro Show. Got a lot coming up for you this hour. A little bit later on in the hour, we'll be joined by Senator Joni Ernst from Iowa. She retained her seat a very, very, very big race because Republicans need to maintain a majority in the Senate. But we begin with all of your vote count updates. So here's where things stand right now. Joe Biden has taken a narrow lead in Pennsylvania. Absentee ballots were being tabulated this morning. That lead is likely to expand over the course of the day. President Trump has filed some lawsuits regarding ballots coming in after the election date and whether those ought to be counted or not. It is unclear how many of those ballots there actually are. Meanwhile, in Arizona, Biden's lead has dropped down to 1.6 points, about 50,000 votes, as more late absentee mail ballots are counted. Late mail voting in Arizona has broken pretty heavily for Trump. So Arizona is probably going to continue to tighten. Uh, it It is unclear whether Trump overtakes Biden in Arizona. Meanwhile, in Georgia, that is edging toward Biden. According to the New York Times, Biden has edged ahead by just over 1,000 votes. There's not much counting left to do. There's a scattering of absentee votes across the state. There will be a recount. There's an automatic recount provision in Georgia law beneath 0.5%. In Nevada, Biden has expanded his lead to about a percentage point or 9,000 votes. His lead is probably going to grow further today because there are 190,000 votes left to be counted. 90% of them are in Clark County, which is a Democratic stronghold. So needless to say, the president is behind the eight ball in terms of the actual vote count. President Trump is protesting that the election has been tampered with, that voter fraud and voter irregularity are the problem. He has launched a series of lawsuits on this basis. Uh, In Philadelphia, he launched a lawsuit claiming that the Philadelphia officials were not allowing Republican Republican poll watchers to actually view what was going on. That lawsuit was successful and injunction was granted nearly immediately. The Trump campaign also put forward a lawsuit to try and bar the counting of ballots that either arrived after Election Day or that were unclearly marked before Election Day. So we'll see how that proceeds. All of this, of course, has led the the left to absolutely lose its mind. So the left is preemptively celebrating, of course. Uh, The left has decided the election is over. This has led to idiocies like David Korn of the nation tweeting out when Trump was elected. I decided I'd only wear black ties. It was a personal and private act of mourning. I didn't say anything about it, and almost no one noticed over these past four years. Today. And then he tweeted out a photo of himself wearing a uh, wearing a silver tie. Wow. The heroism. Just, just wow. So impressive. Meanwhile, folks on the left celebrating and enjoying themselves, uh, but not as much as you might think, because as we'll discuss in just a little while, it turns out that the left really doesn't have all that much to celebrate. Even if Joe Biden were to win a narrow victory over Donald Trump in a extraordinarily heavily voted year, they're not going to have any power against the Republican Senate. They're not going to have any power come 2022 when the Republicans take the House. And in 2024, they would have an 82-year-old Joe Biden going up against somebody in the Republican Party who could theoretically be Trump again, <laughs> right? Or Kamala Harris, who is the least likable candidate to walk the earth since Hillary Clinton. And with all of that said, it is not yet over. The Trump team has put out a statement saying that uh, the preliminary declaration that the election is over is indeed preliminary. They put out a statement suggesting, quote, the election is not over. The false projection of Joe Biden as the winner is based on results in four states that are far from final. Georgia is headed for a recount where we are confident we will find ballots improperly harvested and where President Trump will ultimately prevail. There are many irregularities in Pennsylvania, including having election officials prevent our volunteer legal observers from having meaningful access to vote counting locations. We prevailed in court on our challenge, but were deprived of valuable time and denied the transparency we are entitled to under state law. In Nevada, there appear to be thousands of individuals who improperly cast mail ballots. Finally, the president is on course to win Arizona outright, despite the irresponsible and erroneous calling of the state for Biden by Fox News and the Associated Press. Biden is relying on these states for his phony claim on the White House. But once the election is final, President Trump will be reelected. For what it is worth, the president has also said that obviously he's going to obey the law as they move forward. That doesn't mean that he's going to concede the election under any circumstances. It does mean that uh, he's going to wait for all of this. He's going to wait for all of this to play out. uh, And uh, he's not going to hole up in the White House and uh, do blow and fire machine guns through the door like Al Pacino at the end of Scarface. That's not a thing that's going to happen. But again, this thing is not yet over. And listening to Democrats complain about this not being over, listening to Democrats saying, today ought to be our celebration day. Why can't it be a week from now? Why can't it be two weeks from now? Why is it? Well, we want to celebrate now. It's our right to party. I'm just going to point out that Democrats have undermined legitimate elections for all of my lifetime. Al Gore was on MSNBC yesterday declaring that he defended the election system. Okay, that is not true. Here is Al Gore, very Al Gore, defending America from our election systems, from global warming. Here's Al Gore. 
But the most important principle that I defended 20 years ago that Joe Biden and many others are defending tonight is let's count every legally cast vote and obey the will of the American people. Hey, sorry to break it to Al Gore, but no, he was not a defender of America's voters. Al Gore tried to disenfranchise military ballots. Al Gore attempted to have ballots read by looking to voters' intent, which is insane. That's how you ended up with the pregnant Chad controversy. Not like Chad who works for us being pregnant. Like the pregnant Chad controversy. That's impossible. But the, like like the, the pregnant Chad controversy where people tried to punch their ballot and it didn't wholly work. And so you'd have someone look into their heart to determine who they voted for. Even so, Gore ended up losing that election. Hillary Clinton just last week suggested that the election was stolen from her. So you know, amid all the hue and cry about how Trump is so terrible for saying the election is stolen, then I don't like when anybody says the election is stolen when the election, there's not proof yet that the election was stolen, right? I mean, we're still waiting for all the lawsuits to go forward. We're still waiting for all of the, for all of the information to be tabulated. It's okay to be suspicious. This is why we have a legal process and we should go through the legal process. But Democrats don't have a leg to stand on when they suggest that they stand for election integrity. Here was Hillary Clinton last week suggesting that her election was stolen. There's an air of illegitimacy that surrounds Trump's presidency, and that just infuriates them. It makes them crazy. And that's a big piece of it. So they have to keep striking out at me because why you why well, because of- I was the candidate that they basically stole an election from I was the candidate who won you know nearly three million more votes they stole an election you see it's it's okay when Hillary Clinton says it that's totally fine and it's okay when we spend four years hunting for Russians under our bed because it was probably their fault that Hillary Clinton lost but if Donald Trump says I want to go through the legal process and I think I won with all the legal votes and the illegal votes that are coming in the, the, those are the ones deciding the election then we all have to set our hair on fire. Do I like those kind of statements? No. Do I think that that's hair on fire stuff? Not after the Democrats keep claiming that Georgia Georgia Stacey Abrams is actually the governor over there. She lost by 50,000 votes. 50,000. And Democrats right now are complaining that Trump is filing lawsuits in Wisconsin. He lost Wisconsin by 20,000. Stacey Abrams lost by 50, like two and a half times the margin. And yet Stacey Abrams is a hero of the resistance. So spare me, spare me the crocodile tears just a little bit. So here was President Trump's statement last night. There was some stuff to like, some stuff to hate, as always with President Trump. Here was President Trump last night correctly saying that the polls totally jacked him, that the polls were maybe designed in order to keep people from giving money to the campaigns, particularly in swing states. He said, you know, you, ha- you kept predicting this big blue wave. It wasn't. There was a big red wave. As everybody saw, we won by historic numbers. And the pollsters got it knowingly wrong. They got it knowingly wrong. We had polls that were so ridiculous, and everybody knew it at the time. There was no blue wave that they predicted. They thought there was going to be a big blue wave. That was false. That was done for suppression reasons. But instead, there was a big red wave. And it's been properly acknowledged, actually, by the media. Okay, and uh, he's right about that. He's also correct that this was a great year for Republican women, 13 of whom were added to Congress. Haven't seen any girl power stories from the media yet because they're so objective, right? Here's President Trump correctly calling out the media. This was also the year of the Republican woman. More Republican women were elected to Congress than ever before. That's a great achievement. Okay, that is true. Okay, then we got to the controversial portion. This is where Trump says that they are trying to steal the election. Now, it may very well be that there are people in Philadelphia who've engaged in election fraud. In fact, there was a story back in May of a federal prosecution of a person who's stuffing ballot boxes. That was like 24 ballots here, 40 ballots there, 100 ballots here. Could there be voter fraud in Philadelphia? Sure. Why not? Is it going to amount to tens of thousands of votes? Pretty unlikely. Also, the idea that in every one of these states, including like Georgia, for example, voter fraud is to blame. I mean, the the Georgia Secretary of State is a Republican. The governor is a Republican. In Arizona, the governor is a Republican. And by the way, you're not seeing a lot of claims of voter fraud in Arizona from the Trump campaign, presumably because the late mail-ins are coming in on Trump's side. Nonetheless, here's President Trump saying that they are trying to steal the election. There's tremendous litigation going on, and this is a case where they're trying to steal an election. They're trying to rig an election, and we can't let that happen. Detroit and Philadelphia, known as two of the most corrupt political places anywhere in our country, easily cannot be responsible for engineering the outcome of a presidential race, a very important presidential race. Okay, so yeah, are they trying to steal? You'd have to define the they. You'd have to provide the evidence of the stealing. And that's what lawsuits are for. We have a process for this. Everybody, stop panicking over the fact that Trump says stuff. He says stuff. We all know it. 
Okay, the stuff he says is not always stuff that I like. If this is not baked into the cake by now, I really don't know what it is. Plus, the vote has already taken place, right? Nobody else is voting. It's not like the stuff he says right now is going to shift the vote. It's over. The vote already happened. And President Trump continued along these lines. He said they never believed they could win this honestly. Democrat officials never believed they could win this election honestly. I really believe that. That's why they did the mail-in ballots where there's tremendous corruption and fraud going on. That's why they mailed out tens of millions of unsolicited ballots without any verification measures whatsoever. And I've told everybody that uh, these things would happen because I've seen it happen. Okay, so again, asking questions about this sort of stuff is not forbidden, and this is why we have a legal process, and we'll have to let that play out. Where Trump, of course, goes too far is he says, if you count all the legal votes I win, if you count the illegal votes, they can steal the election. And that's moving beyond the evidence to conjecture, but that's Trump. And again, for the 1,000th time, there's a process for this. Democrats who've spent the last several years claiming that Russians stole the election or that Facebook stole the election, or that Hillary Clinton is the actual president, or that Governor Stacey Abrams of Georgia is, in fact, the governor of Georgia. Uh, they, they have no, I don't want to hear from them, honestly. Here's Trump. If you count the legal votes, I easily win. If you count the illegal votes, they can try to steal the election from us. If you count the votes that came in late, we're looking at them very strongly. But a lot of votes came in late. All righty, so... President Trump concluded by saying that they would take all legal action, which is, of course, where this is always going to go, right? I mean, it's going to go to court. They'll be adjudicated. They'll have to show evidence of the voter fraud. If there is not enough evidence of voter fraud to overturn the results of the election, then this thing is, is over. I mean, that's, that's the way that it's going to work. Right? We do have processes in, these country, in this country. I'm a fan of evidence, as you know. Just as when Democrats claim that every time a white cop shoots a black person, it is racism, and then I say, let's look at the evidence, if we're going to claim voter fraud and voter irregularity, every one of those cases should be fully investigated to the fullest extent of the law. And then we should determine whether there is, in fact, enough evidence to talk about widespread voter fraud resulting in actual changes to the election outcome. Here's President Trump saying that he's going to take legal action. We want an honest election. We want an honest count. And we want honest people working back there because it's a very important job. So that's the way this country is going to win. That's the way the United States will win. And we think we will win the election very easily. We think there's going to be a lot of litigation because we have so much evidence, so much proof, and it's going to end up perhaps at the highest court in the land. We'll see. But we think there'll be a lot of litigation because we can't have an election stolen by, by, like this. Okay, there will be litigation, and then we'll have an answer. Meanwhile, our esteemed journalistic community has deemed it completely off limits for Trump to even discuss voter fraud and voter irregularity, even though, again, Al Gore did this in 2000. John Kerry did some of this in 2004, right? The Diebold machines were going to oust John Kerry from office. We got this from Hillary Clinton last time around. But it, when Trump does it, it's super duper duper much worse than when Democrats do it. Here's Jim Acosta, Jim Acosta Inc. A preemptive celebration from Jim Acosta, who loves himself like no journalist except for Jeffrey Tubin. The president is watching the lights go out on his presidency right now. That is what we're witnessing in real time as these votes are being tabulated and Joe Biden is catching up in Pennsylvania and, and in Georgia. The, the presidency of Donald J. Trump is vanishing before our eyes. OK, so the, the, these journalists, they can't. By, by the way, this has some down ballot effects. If you think that what happened the other night is not a referendum on the failures of the media, you're dead wrong. The media claimed that Joe Biden was going to womp Trump. And not only that, Republicans were going to lose all across the land. Joe Biden was going to enter office with a with a wind at his back, with a with a Democratic Congress, with a Democratic Senate majority, a major Democratic Senate majority. That ain't going to happen. Uh, those media, they've been lying to you. They've been shifting all information through their prism of bias. And that is perfectly obvious. Anderson Cooper, right? Here's another esteemed journalist, another member of our journalistic cadre, trashing Trump and calling him pathetic and fat, which, of course, is, is just what a journalist would do, right? It's sad, and it is truly pathetic, and of course it is dangerous, and of course it will go to courts, but you'll notice the president did not have any evidence. That is the president of the United States. That is the most powerful person in the world, and we see him like an obese turtle on his back, flailing in the hot sun, realizing his time is over. But he just hasn't accepted it, and he wants to take everybody down with him, including this country. <laughs> So there it is, your, your journalistic community. I can't imagine why people showed up in droves because they don't like the media. The, the, the failures of the media here are endemic. 
If Trump is going to talk about a stolen election seriously in the future, I, I think he's on much more solid ground talking about a stolen election on the basis of the media having completely shifted the nature of the race, being awful, being liars. That is that is unimpeachable. I mean, that is the reality. And that doesn't count as stealing in the sense that like votes got shifted secretly in the middle of the night. But if you're talking about the fairness of elections, if you're talking about the overall justice of a media that lies to you, that's a bigger endemic issue than the number of people who are supposedly stuffing ballot boxes in the end, because that's going to outlast any election. So the media are relieved because they think that Trump lost and the adults are back in charge, right? Except for one problem. The adults are not back in charge. There are no adults. OK, let's be real about this. Andrew Bates, the Biden campaign spokesperson, he put out a statement, quote, as we said on July 19th, the American people will decide this election and the United States government is perfectly capable of escorting trespassers out of the White House. Yeah, you, you guys were you were so worried about Trump being a vulgar boor and all of this. Or alternatively, you just didn't like him because he's a Republican and that made you mad. And all of your protestations about his character, it was a bunch of crap. But that's what all this is about, isn't it? I mean, you see it from members of the media all the time, which is that if you are on the right, you're a bad person. And they can't let go of this narrative. They, can't, they, they don't see how damaging it is, by the way. It is very damaging to them. If they would just uh, stop insulting voters for half a second, they might have more of a mandate. But they can't stop insulting voters because they actually believe that if you don't vote with them, you're a bad human being. We need to be lectured by our moral betters. Right? The same people lecturing us about Trump's manners who then proceed to have no manners of their own. Uh, it's, it's pretty impressive stuff. You get this from the media all the time. Joy Reid saying that the race shows that racism and anti-blackness are still dominant in the United States. Blech. Even though we intellectually understand what America is at its base, right, that there is a great amount of racism, anti-blackness, anti-wokeness, this idea that political correctness is some sort of scheme to destroy white America, right? Like, we know what this country is, but you still, part of you, I think part of your, your heart says, you know what, maybe the country is going to pay, pay off all of this pain, the, the children who were stolen with a repudiation. And as the night wore on, and, you, it, and I realized, and it sunk in, okay, that's not happening. Mm. We are still who we thought, you know, Almost unfortunately. Definitely. We are still racist. We are still terrible. America's still racist. And keep saying it over and over and over until you think it's true, at which point you guys will be in the deep electoral minority. I also need more lectures from our late night host. So our late night host did, did some of this over the over the course of the last couple of nights. America's terrible. You guys, you're bad. America should be lamented. Keep doing this, really. Here's the thing that people are missing about the Trump phenomenon in the end. When all is said and done about President Trump, there's a lot of attempt to intellectualize Trump on policy. But the reality is that Trump connected with people because they hate, hate, hate coastal elitists who tell them that they are better than they are. That's really what Trump is about. Trump did not look down on people in middle America and laugh at them or scorn them. That's not what Trump is about. Trump actually hates the same comedians you hate. Remember, those very, very popular comics, those people have maybe, what, 5 million viewers a night? There's 330 million people in this country and 160 million people just voted. Here is a Jimmy Kimmel on our late night comedians informing you that you're a bad person. He is a liar and a cheat who wants them to stop counting thousands of legitimate votes. And almost half of us are apparently OK with that. Be careful, America. If you let Trump do this, then voting could soon become one of those things that people do to feel better but doesn't actually do anything. As usual, the state that got us into this mess was Florida. Every four years, Democrats hope they'll take it. But once again, last night, Florida was called for Donald Trump. Florida is officially America's cheating boyfriend. Why do we always think we can change him? Yeah, just keep pissing on the voters you need, guys. Just keep doing it. We're joined on the line by Senator Joni Ernst. The pollster suggested that she was in a dogfight with her opponent, Teresa Greenfield. It turns out that that dogfight was not much of a dogfight. In the end, Senator Joni Ernst prevails. It is a huge win because it probably assures a Republican majority in the Senate. Senator Ernst, thanks so much for joining the show, and congratulations. Oh, my gosh. It's so great to be to be done. And, of course, thanks to all of my supporters who came out in force. Yep, we put this one to bed. And you put it to bed pretty easily, as it turns out, in the final analysis. What do you think the pollsters completely missed? Because they missed Iowa by, by everything, except for the Seltzer poll, which, of course, got it right, as they do pretty much every time. Right. And I think they miss so much um, about our rural voters. They tend to to lean a little more Republican, of course, and they turn out in force. And so, you know, the pollsters, they've gotten it wrong in so many of the races this year. And again, just just thankful to 
you know, have the support of the, the people of Iowa. I didn't pay attention to the polls because I, I didn't feel that the polls were right. I felt a different level of energy and enthusiasm. And of course, you know, the polls weren't right about President Trump either. They had him neck and neck with Joe Biden and he, he put it to bed easily as well. OK, so let's talk for a second about what you think the message of the election is. We'll get to the presidential race in just a second. But what do you think the message of the election is? I, th- I think that the message of the election is that the Democrats tacked so far to the left in the obvious opinion that Trump was just so unpopular they could be able to, to do that and pick up seats. Instead, they lose House seats all over the country. They don't take any of the state legislatures in a redistricting year. It's basically a disaster for them. Their coalition seems to be coming apart at, at the seams. Uh, they might be able to mask that. Uh, if, if Joe Biden ends up winning the election after all of the legal tallies and everything. But it's not going to be much of a mask. That, that coalition looks like it's fragmenting. Right. And Ben, I think you're absolutely correct in that the left has gone so far to the left that it has disenfranchised so many of their voters. You know, you look across the Midwest and in particular here in Iowa, our Democratic voters are much more to the middle. You know, we do have our, our fringe group. But they want to see people working together to get things done. They don't want to see things like the Green New Deal. They don't want to see things like packing the Supreme Court. Um, So, you know, the left has overplayed their hand. And I hope that they learn from that lesson. And so uh, when when you look at the Democratic left, do you you really think that they're going to learn that lesson? I, I have a feeling they won't. It seems like they're sort of held hostage by a wild leftist base. Uh, you saw this. I don't know if you were aware of this, Senator Ernst, but there was this this leaked phone call, the DCCC phone call last night, in which basically all hell broke loose. Abigail Spanberger, who's running in a purple district and, and may have barely pulled out a race against Nick Freitas, she went off on the squad. She said that we can't say socialism anymore. We have to stop talking about defunding the police. Meanwhile, you had Rashida Tlaib saying you want to leave the priorities of black people behind and you and you, you only care about rural white people. That, that coalition does not look like it is it is something that can last even in the next couple of years. No. And I look at AOC and the demand she's making and, of course, Chuck Schumer cowering to AOC and pushing all of the Senate Democrats further to the left. And, you know, we saw that with even my opponent while she tried to play off as a moderate. I mean, she was backed by AOC. She was backed by a number of these far leftist liberal organizations. And Iowans saw that and they said, no, thank you. No way. No how. Um, So I don't know if they're going to learn their lesson, but I certainly hope they do. Senator Joni Ernst, I want to ask you about control of the the Senate. So obviously your race was not just important because we need more Republican senators from Iowa, but obviously we need more Republican senators generally. It was slated that Republicans had maybe a 25 percent shot of keeping the Senate uh, this was maybe my my only good election call of the last several years. I thought that Republicans would maintain the Senate. I thought that you would win your race. I thought Susan Collins was going to win her race. Now it looks like Republicans are, in fact, going to retain the Senate. And even if Joe Biden were to be made president of the United States, you'll be facing up to a Senate majority led by Republicans. How important is that? It is extremely important and, you know, just very telling. I ran to the grocery store last night and ran into a number of friends there and and uh, they were asking me about the presidential. They're very worried about the outcome of the presidential. And the only uh, saving grace, they said, is that you've kept your seat and the Senate should stay a Republican majority. And it is the last line of defense when it comes to the crazy radical ideas that are trying to be pushed by people like AOC and the squad, pushed by Chuck Schumer in order to, you know, appease those on the far, far left. Um, So, again, things like, you know, the Green New Deal, uh, Medicare for all, socialized medicine, um, all of those things of packing the court. That was a big concern here. Uh, All of those things can be kept in check with a Republican majority in the Senate. It's like that last line of sanity. You know, should we have a, a President Joe Biden? We're speaking to Senator Joni Ernst. So, Senator Ernst, one of the, uh, I think there are a lot of marks of optimism for Republicans in this election, again, regardless of the presidential outcome. One of the marks of optimism is, I think, the, the growth of Republicanism uh, among non white voters. Uh, President Trump won a, a large number of Latino voters, particularly, he did well with Hispanics in, in Florida, in, in Texas. And, and he did an outside share of, of uh, Republican. He got an outside share of Republican votes uh, among black Americans as well. Uh, th- this looks like a much more durable coalition going forward. It looks as though 
the, the woke notion that demographics are destiny, which is shared by the, the racist alt-right, actually. They're, they're all of the same piece, which is that you can judge people simply by the color of their skin and not by anything else. That is breaking down. And if people are treated as individuals, it looks as though you could easily see a situation in which Republicans continue to garner larger shares of the Hispanic and black vote and simultaneously bring back in women who may not have voted for President Trump in 2016 or 2020 moving forward. Yes, I think that is so important. And I think through the movements we've seen over the course of the last year, those that really want to see solutions put into place. Um, you know, I've had a, a number of meetings with members of the African-American community here in Iowa. And, you know, there's some brilliant young leaders out there and they see their path forward as economic prosperity. And how do you get there? You get there by following the policies of President Donald J. Trump. So it, as we're lifting people out of poverty, you know, that's not a thing based on the color of your skin. It applies to, you know, all demographics out there. But again, there's just so many people now that are recognizing, you know, we can do better for our communities. We need to work together. We need economic prosperity. And, you know, I, I've had such great conversations with people. And, you know, I had a, a member of the African-American community, a dear friend of mine that sat with me all night. Um, as we were watching the election results coming in and we had this conversation he said, I'm a Democrat. And I told him, you know, I don't think you are a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, but he was there to support me. And so it's, it's kind of an awakening that we are seeing in certain communities, um, certainly in some of the Hispanic communities with some of the issues that are important to them. Um, of course, it, again, comes back to economic prosperity. You know, it, it uh, lifts a lot of folks up and provides them a brighter future. We're speaking to Senator Joni Ernst. So let's turn to the presidential race for just a moment. Obviously, this thing is still hotly fraught. You're seeing networks today calling the election for Joe Biden because Biden apparently has pulled ahead in the vote count in Pennsylvania. Georgia remains extraordinarily tight. Arizona remains extraordinarily tight. Nevada remains extraordinarily tight. The president is claiming that the only way that he could win is through voter irregularity. Um, you know, I, I'm skeptical of the claim that's the only way that, that he could lose. Uh, but certainly, I think all of these claims should be sussed out. I mean, this is why we have a legal process. Uh, and I, it seems to me that the American people should be patient enough for another week to figure out uh, who exactly won and make sure that all the legal ballots get counted. Absolutely, Ben. Um, I'm 100% in agreement because I, I did serve as a county auditor here in Iowa, um, also as an elections commissioner. And so every state has their own process and system. But uh, what we do know is that any ballots that were cast legally should be counted. Any ballots that were not cast uh, legally, then they should not be counted. And the likely outcome is that this will um, have to go through the court, possibly. Um, and if so, then we will see uh, we'll see that process play out. But again, we do need to be patient, and we need to make sure that that we are um, adhering to the laws that are available in each of our states. And hopefully the president will have a good outcome. Um, but again, if ballots were cast legally, you know, by qualified voters, those ballots should be counted. Well, Senator Joni Ernst, again, congratulations on a major win. has serious ramifications, not just for your state, but for the nation as a whole. It's a big win. It's an important win. And uh, thank you for running such an excellent race. Oh, you betcha, Ben. And, and again, thanks to all my supporters. I really do appreciate it. Well, all the talk about the presidential election is obscuring a big problem for Democrats. Their coalition is utterly unworkable. Nancy Pelosi refuses to step down, refuses, refuses. She's, again, launching a bid to keep the gavel for another two years. She's led the caucus since 2003. She's actually been a terrible Speaker of the House, a legit awful Speaker of the House. She has now presided over the Democrats getting their butts kicked in 2010, and then the Democrats getting their butts kicked again in 2014. And then again, the Democrats getting their butts kicked in 2020. So she's been here forever, just like every other Democratic leader. The geriatric ward of the Democratic Party continues to maintain control and be lauded by the media for their genius. But the fact is that they are falling apart a little bit. Pelosi alluded in her letter to her fellow Democrats to the tensions within the party, noting the, quote, diverse viewpoints of our Democratic caucus and the urgency of the challenges ahead. She said, our caucus is blessed with many diverse and entrepreneurial perspectives. Uh, okay, that, that is one way of putting it, that your coalition is utterly unworkable. So in what had to be the most entertaining 
development of yesterday evening. There was a Democratic House caucus call. Absolute mess. Absolute mess. Erica Werner, Washington Post congressional reporter, was being leaked the contents of this call by other Democrats who were on the call because understand that for the Democrats and the media, they're the same. Right? Democrats just see the media as their House organ, the outlet for their communication strategy. So here is what Erica Warner reported. Abigail Spanberger, who is a Democratic congresswoman from Virginia, she barely, barely, barely retained her seat by like 5,000 votes out of 450,000 cast. Spanberger on the Democratic caucus call, quote, we lost races we shouldn't have lost. Defund police almost cost me my race because of an attack ad. Don't say socialism ever again. Need to get back to basics, in parentheses, is yelling. <laughs> Which is a great way to start. By the way, that's right. Right, socialism. That word socialism may have cost the Democrats Florida. Because it turns out, you know, who doesn't like socialism? Anyone who has ever lived in a socialist country. Heavily Latino areas hate socialism. Defund police. You know, I don't like that. Nearly anybody. White people don't like it. Black people don't like it. Latino people don't like it. Get rid of the cops. And guess what? The people who thrive are criminals. If we run this race again, we'll get effing torn apart in 2022, Spanberger says. Then Pelosi came back on and said she disagrees. They won the House and the presidency. Ah, ha, 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 ha. So you went from Democrats were supposed to pick up five to 10 seats to Democrats lost 10 to 15 seats. And Pelosi says that's a victory. Why? Because here's the problem. Nancy Pelosi, it's too late. It's too late for Nancy Pelosi. The squad is in the bloodstream. As I said earlier on the program, the, the Democratic Party is basically the elderly, the aging Hollywood star attempting to in, energize himself by finding some 20-year-old aspiring star and literally taking his blood out of his body and then injecting it in himself. By the way, this is a weird thing Hollywood stars do. I'm not kidding. This is an actual thing. Okay, so that is what Nancy Pelosi is. She was living off the energy of the Democratic Socialist, the squad, woo, the Ilhan Omars and the, and the Ayanna Presleys and the Rashida Tlaibs and the Honorable Congresswoman Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez D. Twitch. Right, they were living off that. And then it turns out that um, there's only one problem, which is there's leukemia in that bloodstream. It kills the host. So Pelosi says they have a mandate. Also earlier in the call, Debbie McCaskill Powell, who lost her race, was crying. She mentioned how people can't pronounce her name and said, stop being negative on Twitter. Hakeem Jeffries, who is Pelosi's second in command and widely perceived to be her heir, comes back on to tell people to stop leaking and that reporters aren't your friends. Meanwhile, Representative Jayapal was telling Jeffries to find the leakers. It just keeps going as Pascrell now calls out Schumer. Pelosi's done an amazing job, but where's Schumer in all this? Says Pelosi has one hand tied behind her back. Then Rashida Tlaib chimed in and said, before we make painful statements, we need to wait and see how the numbers come down. Feels like I'm being asked to be quiet. We need to appeal to certain people, and that not, that's not right. What Rashida Tlaib actually said, according to the Washington Post, by the way, is that it seems like the Democrats care more about rural white voters than black voters. Good luck with this coalition, gang. Good luck. Good effing luck. The end is in sight for the Democratic caucus call that started more than two hours ago, said Erica Warner, wrapping up. Jeffrey said seven to eight members in queue, and then we'll wrap up. One more random detail. Earl Blumenauer said marijuana was the big winner of the election, so that's big. The Democrats really focusing in on the things that people deeply, deeply care about. So th this broke out into the open in a variety of ways over the, last, over the last couple of days. Perhaps most amusingly, Claire McCaskill was on MSNBC, and she points out the obvious, which is Democrats ignored the issues, and that's why they lost. The Republican Party, I think, very uh, adroitly adopted cultural issues as part of their main theme, whether you're talking guns or issues surrounding the right to abortion in this country or things like gay marriage and the right for transsexuals and, and other people who we as a party have tried to, quote unquote, look after and make sure that they're treated fairly as we you know, circled those issues, we left some voters behind and Republicans dove in with a vengeance. Okay, Claire McCaskill is right about this. They left all these voters behind. It turns out there are a bunch of socially conservative Democratic voters, black, white, and Hispanic, who don't like all of the culture war crap. And Democrats decided to focus in on it. They don't like the word socialism. They don't like defund the police. So naturally, this prompted soul searching from uh, the honorable Congresswoman Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. I call her that because I've been informed by her that it is sexist to call her AOC, despite the fact that her Twitter handle is AOC. So the honorable, estimable Congresswoman Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez de Twitch, she tweeted out, why do we listen to people who lost elections as if they are experts in winning elections? McCaskill tried her approach. She ran as a caravan hysteria dem and lost, while grassroots organizers won progressive measures in Missouri. Her language here shows how she took her base for granted. 
So um, I'm just going to uh, point out here that AOC, sorry, Representative Ocasio-Cortez, de Green New Deal, de Brooklyn, right? She says that she knows how to win in Missouri. Oh man, Nancy Pelosi, have fun with this gang. Seriously, have fun with these folks because they are a party. You have an utterly unwieldy coalition. You got a bunch of socialists who refuse to stop saying socialism even when it damages the party in other areas of the country. You got a bunch of people who think the transgender locker rooms are a top priority, even while you got voters who are dying of heroin overdoses. You got a bunch of folks who think that Black Lives Matter and defund the police are a good idea. Right? Just enjoy yourselves, gang. It's going to be a party. It's going to be a party. No wonder the Democrats are uh, falling apart. It turns out the intersectional coalition of Barack Obama only works when Barack Obama is in charge to pretend that it works. Even then, it didn't work so well. But certainly, it's not working now. Okay, I wish to conclude the week with a little bit of uplift. So every week, I do a little bit of a Bible talk at the very end of the Friday show. So this week, the Jews read a portion of Genesis that surrounds Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is one of the most fascinating portions of the Bible because this is the first time that you really see human beings negotiating with God. God says he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Abraham asks God, will you spare it if we can find 50 righteous people? And God says, yes. He says, 40 righteous people. God says, yes. He says, 30 righteous people. He says, yes, 20, yes, 10, yes. Okay, and then that's the end of the conversation. And now what, what most people read that is, is God then says to Abraham, I can't find 10, I'm destroying it. That's not actually what happens. That's not actually what happens. The next thing that happens in the Bible is the move to Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Two angels come to Sodom in the evening and Lot is sitting in the gate of Sodom and Lot saw and arose and he welcomes them to his house. And here are the people who are in Lot's house. So he's now got two angels, right? So it's two those two angels plus Lot. He has two daughters, right? So that means five. He's got his wife, that's six. And he's got his two sons-in-law, that's eight. So all that Abraham needs in order to preserve Sodom and Gomorrah is two more people to stand up. Two more people in the entire city to stand up for righteousness and the entire city gets spared even though it's filled with tons and tons of bad people. Instead, as the Bible says, everybody shows up to try and uh, to try and abuse the visitors. It says in the Bible that the entire town shows up, everyone, the men, the women, the children, young and old, the entire populace. So here's the reality. All it takes to stand up to the bad guys is just a couple of people. That's it. Just a couple, not one, two, because you need some solidarity. It's hard to be the lone voice. But all it takes is a few righteous people standing up to sin, and you can spare the entire city because you can fight back from that base. So remember that going into the weekend, no matter how this election ends. The, the fight has only just begun for the soul of the country and for the future of the country, and all it takes is a little bit of solidarity and a solid core group to fight back against that, and you can still save the city. That's the real message of what Abraham talks about with God. There were just two people away in Sodom and Gomorrah from saving the city. The two people didn't materialize, the city gets destroyed. So find a friend, team up, and then try and save the country. I think we can all do that together. All righty, we'll be back here next week with all of the recaps of the news. I'm sure it is going to be a hotly fought weekend. So try to rest up. By the time we see you on Monday, we'll know a lot more about where things stand. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Hold up. 